tonight. Well, I hope you have your Bibles with you, and if you do, that you'll turn to John chapter 3. Tonight, we're going to talk about the truth, the truth about surrender, and then tomorrow afternoon when I'm with you, I'll, I'm going to tell you the truth about sacrifice. So tonight being the truth about surrender, and I'm, I'm just going to jump right in there by telling you this. My sister, her name is Mitzi, had her second daughter in the car on the way to the hospital. And she and her husband were, they lived about 45 minutes outside of town in the country. And she'd already been to the hospital three times with false labor. And so she determined she would not do that again. They already knew her by name. And so she waited and her water broke while she was home. And so they got in the car, took off on their way to the hospital and had a flat tire. Her husband went and changed the tire, and as they were speeding along the way, they had their toddler in the back seat. Luckily, she was too young to be traumatized by this activity. <laughs> but while they're speeding on to the hospital, she's taking her, bre her breaths, you know, like we pant like dogs, whatever it is you're supposed to do. And, and he's going through the very last intersection before they get to the hospital, and he catches the little baby's head as, it, as the baby's coming out. When I talked to her, I was like, oh, Mitzi, you're like my hero. She's like, no, Leanne. I was like, folding my legs and squeezing, you know, that baby, I didn't want it to come. And, um, I mean, just a bizarre story. But she could tell you today that birth is messy. I don't even want to think about all of that. But the reason I start with telling this is because so is surrender. Surrender is messy. And Jesus actually used the illustration of birth to explain to us what surrender really means. When he met Nicodemus at night, and our recording of that is John chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. There was a, na a man, I have got it written in my notes in the New International Version, but sometimes I like, I've been, I was about to say playing with, but that's not a good thing to say about God's Word, is it? But I've been reading the Bible out of the New Living Translation just because it's, it's refreshing sometimes to switch up your translations and hear the Word said in just a little bit of a different way. So I think I'm going to read it to you out of the New Living Translation tonight. There was a man named Nicodemus, a Jewish religious leader who was a Pharisee. After dark one evening, he came to speak with Jesus. Rabbi, he said, we all know that God sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are evidence that God is with you. And then he said, uh, Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. What do you mean, exclaimed Nicodemus? How can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? Jesus replied, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the Spirit. Humans can reproduce only human life, but the Spirit, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. So don't be surprised when I say to you, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it wants, just as you can hear the wind but can't tell where it comes from or where it's going. You can't explain how people are born of the Spirit. And so here we, we have a Pharisee who's a religious leader of the day, and most of Jesus' confrontations or conversations with Pharisees are more like confrontations. But in this one, Nicodemus comes to Jesus sincerely interested in what it means and what Jesus is teaching about this relationship with God and actually the coming into the kingdom of God. I love how Jesus comes to um, Nicodemus and receives him gladly and speaks to him heart to heart. I also love how Nicodemus starts the conversation by saying, we kind of believe this. And then he gets more personal by saying, what must an old man like me do? He's kind of talking in third person, just in case I was interested in doing what you're talking about. What must I do as he's trying to understand what it means to be born again? Well, I think that I can safely say in the room tonight that we have all been born once. <laughs> and we all started out in the same place. We all began in our mother's womb. And of no doing of our own, 
What was inside of our father got to be inside of our mother. This is the way I would explain it to my four-year-old child if they asked. <laughs> it just got to be in there. And together, God made it multiply, and he literally knit us together in the most marvelous way while we were hidden in a very dark place that was custom-made, a world that was perfect for us at that stage of our lives. That perfect world that still the medical community cannot quite duplicate, even though we've, we've made great advancements in that. We had absolutely nothing to do with our coming about. We had nothing to say about how we were knit together and if we would be created at all or even when we were created, what we would look like. And most of the time, we consider the day that we were born our birth date or the day that we became alive. But was that really the day that we became alive? No, we actually lived for a whole nine months in a completely different world. And then the fullness of time came and that world was no longer right for us. And that world became what would not be right for us. And through great pain and great labor, our mothers birthed us into a different world where we did not eat the same, we did not sleep the same, we did not um, see things the same. Everything was different about this whole new world. Our nesting place was no longer a good place for us because we were not conceived to live in that world. We were conceived to only be there for a little while and then to be birthed into life, what we call life in the world in which we, we live today. Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. And when he said that, he was using this analogy of physical birth. Of course, we can't go back into our mother's wombs and be born again. And so Jesus then says... Humans give birth to humans, but the Holy Spirit gives spiritual birth or brand new birth to our spirit. Our spirits come alive when we are born again by the power of God. So how is physical birth the same as spiritual birth? Here's my answer. They both require a letting go of one world in order to live in another. Both physical birth and spiritual birth require a letting go of one world in order to live in another. In other words, surrender. Did you say that word aloud? Surrender. So surrender is a letting go. Now I imagine when Jesus was explaining this to Nicodemus, probably Nicodemus began to have this look on his face like, my goodness, what are you talking about? Can y'all look at each other and give yourselves a Nicodemus look? Like, what is that? <laughs> yeah. He, he probably squinted his eyes and went... Because I can just see Nicodemus thinking, that isn't happening. Like, I cannot go back and do that again. None of us even, we just don't even want to think about it. Isn't it funny how none of us want to think about our parents even doing that kind of stuff? Like, you don't do it. That's the way we're, we all like that. Like, our kids think they're the only ones that are like that, you know. And I'm, I could get off track there, but I'm not going to. <laughs> But basically what Jesus was saying to Nicodemus is what he's saying to us tonight. And that is in order to live spiritually in the spiritual life, even in the world that we live in today, we have to let go of the old way of life. And we also have to let go of our old way of thinking. And that's where he was challenging Nicodemus to let go of his old way of thinking. Nicodemus needed to surrender his mind because he, what he wanted to do was figure God out and then decide what he was going to do with God. But what God is inviting Nicodemus to do is choose God and then begin to understand God from this place of being born again. So when Jesus explained that the wind would blow wherever it pleases, the, the, Hebrew, the Greek word for wind is pneuma, which is spelled with a P, like panuma, and is translated in the New Testament as both wind and spirit. Some scholars believe that perhaps the wind was blowing around Nicodemus and Jesus. And Jesus just grabbed hold of that living illustration. He said, just like the wind 
The, wherever the wind blows, that is where, um, the, where birth happens. Just like the Spirit will come, like the wind, to whom it is that He comes. You hear the sound of it, you don't know where it's coming from or where it's going. And so what he was saying is that in order to make his point that the Spirit of God cannot be fully captured or understood just like the wind. Would you all agree with me that God honestly cannot be fully understood? You've lived enough life to know that sometimes the right answer in ministry is, I don't know. And I, I can't understand that. Nicodemus was an educated man and he was eager to discover truth. And he, like many of us, did want to figure God out. But he needed to respond first and then follow up with a journey of learning and getting to know God. This is what we call faith. Stepping out into what we don't know in order to learn more. Jesus encouraged Nicodemus to take this step of faith. I'll tell you the truth. No one can see the kingdom of God unless he's born again. Surrender like birth is very messy. In order to be born, we had to let go of that old world. When you, many of you have given birth, I've given birth three times, and when we do, one of the first things that happens to a newborn baby is what? The umbilical cord is cut. So that which linked them to that old world was completely severed. And for the first time in our baby's lives, they are taken away, completely out of and away from the old world that they knew. Some of us, when we were born, were born long enough ago that we were probably pulled up by our ankles and smacked on the bottom. That's like, welcome to life, you know? I don't know why they thought they had to do that. But then the baby would yell. And I remember when my baby was first born. Michael is my firstborn. And when she came into this world, I was, I was so anxious like we all are to hear her cry because that means all is well. She's here. We've gotten through this trauma of birth. And she did. She gave us one little cry and that was it. She did not cry anymore, but immediately her eyes popped open. And in that delivery room, she's just taking it all in. Like she is watching and seeing. You know, and that's unusual for babies, I've learned, because my other two didn't do that. But just just taking in this new world that's very different than the old. And for our babies there and us too, there was no going back. You wouldn't even think of going back to that old way of life because it no longer fits for you. Eventually, you have to let go of everything that connected you there. I guess that I slept through my childbirth classes because after my baby was born, I, I thought I might have twins. Because there was still stuff to be birthed. Do y'all remember that part? <laughs> See, I, I'm getting into the messiest of it too now. But when that stuff had to be born, I was like, what is this? Well, of course, that was the nourishment and what kept my baby fed while she's inside of this old world, inside of this body. And obviously, she would not need that anymore. Because in this new world, she would be fed differently. Her food would come from a different place, a different source. Actually, it still came from her mama for us at that time. But it was in a totally different way. You know, as, as, as um, kind of raw as this is, where I'm going. When we are born spiritually, we no longer need to be linked to the things that kept us going. Kept us going emotionally, socially, in, intellectually, in any other way. We need to cut that cord to that old way of life and, and begin to walk and understand where our new nourishment and being fed is coming from in this new way of life. Jesus said we must be born again, which includes the letting go of every bit of that. Let me ask you this question. Had, had my daughter Michael never been born, would she have ever lived? Maybe since she, she came and lived for nine months in the womb, but we would have said it was a stillbirth. And in our minds, we would have thought that baby never really lived. And that is a thought to ponder because as you think about being born again and the spiritual life is the real life, then is a person who hasn't yet experienced that, are they really living at all? Or is it only like the life that happens in a nesting place to prepare them to be birthed really? Jesus said we must be born again. 
And it's only when we've been born again that we truly live. Surrender is a new birth. It's a rebirth. It's a coming into a new world where the things of our old life are no longer sufficient to sustain us. This is a picture, of course, of my two granddaughters. You know with screens this big, I'm going to find a way to put them up there on it. <laughs> But this is my granddaughter, Misty, who's three and a half in this picture, and my granddaughter, River Jamie, who was just born when this was made. Surrender is new birth, and it's also messy. Secondly, I want you to know that re surrender requires conscious effort. When my daughter, Michael, turned 18, we had a brunch for her at my dear friend's house. And at this brunch, I invited significant women in her life, women who had taught her in her Bible study classes at church, women who had been teachers or babysitters or coaches, or they had just spoken into her life through the years. So there were about 18 women at this brunch. And the purpose of the brunch was to bless Michael at 18 years old. And she's, she's sitting there. We've enjoyed good food and fellowship. And I'd asked all of the women to bring a Bible verse to give to Michael on her 18th birthday. And they began to go around the circle and share a verse. And would you know that 14 out of the 18 women there chose this verse, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. It became almost laughable that so many women had chosen the same verse. And we were like, boy, Michael, if you wondered what God wanted to say to you today, we've no doubt what it is that he wanted to say. And this is it. Y'all read it aloud together with me. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. Well, I didn't know it at the time, but my daughter Michael needed this verse more than ever. For already she had begun to steer off of the path that she had been reared to walk in. And she was making decisions on her own. And, and try as she may, she was trying to live with these conflictions in her heart. She was dating a boy that was not good for her. He did not love the Lord and he did not respect us, her parents. And as she was dating him, she was beginning to choose to love him and to fall in love with him and had already begun to be in blatant disobedience to the moral standards that, that she'd been taught. I didn't know it at the time, but about two weeks after she graduated from high school, she moved out of our home and into an apartment with her boyfriend. God was audibly telling Michael to trust him. Surrender requires conscious effort. And these verses tell us exactly how to surrender to God with conscious effort. The first is to trust in the Lord with all your heart. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. We tend to place our trust on the people that we can count on. And my question to you tonight is, can you count on God? Oh, goodness, that is so good. If you truly can and you are that spontaneous with your conviction that you can count on God, I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, I can count on God. Some of you sound very confident in that. Others are like, well, yeah, okay, I can count on God too. <laughs> well, I want you to know that I thought I could count on God as well until this happened. And when Michael left us and moved in with her boyfriend, Tom and I, man, we were counting on God. We hit our knees and we began to pray. Lord, bring her to her senses. That was our main prayer, still is every day for all our kids. Bring them to their senses, which basically means get them to see life the way I see it and do it the way I think they ought to. That's what that really means. And so, you know, I already talked to y'all in the breakout, Jerry Mama 2911, all the way. Jerry Mama, Mama's got some plans for you, and they are good, so do them. That's all you need to know, you know, next question. But we hit our knees and we began to pray, and our main prayer was, please don't let there be a child conceived in this union. Please don't let there be a child. Of course, you know, at first I'm like, please don't let them be having sex. Like, how naive was I? <laughs> So I did get over that prayer, and I was like, please, please. I mean, she's wearing her true love weights ring, for goodness sake. But anyway, um, I'm not going to go off on that tangent either. Something came to my mind, but I won't do it. Please, Lord, don't let there be a baby. Please don't let there be a baby. And about three weeks later, she discovered and we discovered that she was pregnant. At that point, I wish that I could stand before you tonight and say I was anchoring, and, man, I was trusting God with all my heart. 
but I was not. I said to my husband, we will no longer pray in specifics because it seemed to me, we're going to keep it all general just in case anything gets out there. It seemed to me that the devil was listening more to my prayers than God was. For something was happening in my life that was unthinkable. My 18-year-old daughter was going to have a baby with a man that was toxic to her. And then when that happened, we'll fast forward to my, my granddaughter's birth. <clears throat> and throughout the months, I, I built a very fragile relationship with my daughter, rebuilt this relationship through that difficult season of our lives. And when River Jamie was born, I'm going to need to grab my water bottle. I'm sorry, I've got a tickle in my throat. Thank you. And when River Jamie, I mean, not River Jamie, that's my newest baby. This is Misty. Mm. When, when, when Misty was born, um, Michael married her boyfriend. And I'm, I'm making sure I'm not getting away from me. And I was devastated. But God knew this. And my, my son-in-law now said to his little wife, my daughter, <laughs> that his daughter would have absolutely nothing to do with us, with my husband and me. And um, because in his mind, part of the spiritual warfare of all of that was that we were the bad guys. And, of course, we thought he was. <laughs> he thought we were. I don't know. But... There was this beautiful baby, and I was listening to the voice of the devil basically saying I would have nothing to do with my, child, with my granddaughter. And there are so many promises in God's word that say otherwise. And so I just was trusting the Lord with all my heart or trying to. And at that same time, I don't have time to go into it completely, but um, I'm going to have to give you all the short version because of, of time frame. But I had been diagnosed the year before with colon cancer. And fortunately, it was staged at stage one, and I'd had surgery. And so the only follow-up was, besides going to the oncologist every once in a while, was to go have a colonoscopy a year, a year later. And if any of you have ever had a colonoscopy, there's this delightful little drug that they give you when you have it. And it is wonderful. It makes you forget all your worries, as if you had no worries at all. And so at this time in my life when there was going to be no relationship with my grandchild at all, and my daughter is in a fog of having had a baby at 18 and getting married and all that, and she said to me, we need a break from y'all. I was like, okay. And I went to go have the colonoscopy, and my drug didn't take effect. That's the quick of it. My drug didn't work. That was really sad. Because I thought <laughs> that drug was going to be my miracle. You know, like that was going to be God taking care of me. Well, it didn't work. I came home, and I got on Facebook. Because when your drugs don't work, just get on Facebook. <laughs> That's what you do. <laughs> so... I got on Facebook, and on Facebook, I got a message from a friend from high school. And the short of it is, she said that she was going to commit suicide when she was 15 years old. Never told me this. But that instead, she went to church because of um, witness that I had given her and our relationship that we had. And she was saved. She and, and just about all of her family. And shared with me after 30 years that this had always been a part of her testimony. And she'd thought many times about getting in touch with me to tell me but had decided at this time to do that. And the main reason was that a week before, the Lord had awakened her at night, or come to her really basically in her dream, and said, tell Leanne that I know what's going on with her and that I'm, it's going to be okay, that I'm taking care of it. And then she closed it by sharing with me what Henrietta Mears, who is the woman that is credited with many things, one of them is having discipled Bill Bright, who was head of Campus Crusade, and um, Billy Graham even said, other than his wife and his mother, she was the woman that had the most influence on his life. When she came to the end of her life and died, a great woman in the ministry, some people came to her and asked, what would you do differently? And she said, I would trust him more. And on that day, my friend from high school so much better than a drug, said to me, trust him more. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And then the next part of this verse says, lean not on your own understanding. Lean not on your own understanding. This is easier for some than it is for others because some people are, are driven by their reasoning. They've got to reason it out with their logic. My daughter Kaylee is a logic person and, and she tries to wrap her head around it and to figure it out. But what Jesus was saying to Nicodemus is with your 
understanding that's separated from spiritual birth. You're never going to wrap your mind around the mysteries that are only there for those that have been born of the Spirit. But when we've been born of the Spirit, we have to let go of our old way of understanding because God's ways are not man's ways. And the ways of the world will always stand in contrast to the ways of the Lord. And mostly we need to understand that His perspective is eternal, not temporal. And so lean not on your own understanding. Rick Warren, pastor of Saddleback Church in California, wrote this about surrendering your life. He said, surrendering your life means following God's lead without knowing where he's sending you. Waiting for God's timing without knowing when it will come. Expecting a miracle without knowing how God will provide it. And trusting God's purpose without understanding the circumstances. And as you hear him say these words in the context of the loss that he has suffered recently when his own son um, committed suicide, you begin to, to hear the depth of truth in them. Surrender is following God. You know you're surrendered to God when you rely on God to work things out instead of trying to manipulate others, force your agenda, or control the situation. You let go and you let God work. You don't always have to be in charge. And instead of trying harder, you trust Him more. Lean not on your own understanding. Remember my prayers for my granddaughter and how I asked God please not to let her be conceived in that, in that other world where they're conceived? Tom and I begged God not to create her. Well, when my daughter heard this from her husband, she wasn't about to let that go about. And so about two weeks into my granddaughter's life, she began to smuggle her to me. She smuggled her. The funny thing about it is her cover was this wild friend she had, and she told her mother-in-law all the time she was going out with this wild friend, and the whole time she's with her wild mama with the baby. <laughs> I had a little satisfaction in that part of the, the whole thing, but eventually her husband discovered her secret life and, uh, with her family, and he relented, and um, God did an amazing thing. He knit the heart of this nana around the heart of that child, and today we are like Tweedledee and Tweedledum. We're like peanut butter and jelly. We're like two peas in a pod. Two Christmases ago, my son TJ, who's 19 now, he asked Misty, he said, Misty, who is your, who is your favorite in all the world? And he just finished playing with her a lot, so he knew she was going to say TJ. She goes, Nana. <laughs> and then he said, okay, okay, we all get that. He was like, okay, I'll give you that. He said, but who's your second favorite in all the world? And she said, Nana. <laughs> he goes, okay, okay, I got it. Nana's first, Nana's second. That is okay. He said, well, then what about your third? And by this time, she stomps her little foot, and she goes, Nana. Like, what is it? They don't even try anymore. They just know. We are, we are so tight. Lean not on your own understanding. The third part of Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says this, In all your ways acknowledge Him. And this is the third step to consciously choosing to live a surrendered life. Acknowledge Him. Know to whom it is you are surrendered. Worship God in His holiness. Praise Him. Thank Him. Take time to recognize Him. Just spend some time in His presence and allow the who that He is to fill up your surroundings and join the angels in giving God the glory that is due His name. Acknowledge Him. Meditate on His goodness. Understand His faithfulness. Recall the ways that He's been good and faithful and gentle and kind and long-suffering and, and forbearing and patient and all of the things that he is in your life and in the lives of those that you love. Acknowledge God in all your ways. And then the very last part of that verse says, He will make your paths straight. When Misty was two, her father came back from Afghanistan. He'd been 
deployed. He worked for the Army, enlisted in the Army soon after she was born, and, and he was deployed for a glorious nine months. <laughs> and I say it was glorious because Misty and Michael came to live with me during that time, and the time just flew way too fast, and it was time for him to, become, to come home. And we went back and, and celebrated that homecoming, and here's a picture, I believe, of me throwing Misty in the air at that homecoming celebration. And you can see the benefit of being with her Nana for nine months straight. She is just pure, pure joy. Well, in handing her back into that home, my heart was so burdened and so heavy, for the relationship was still extremely toxic for my daughter, really for my son-in-law, and, and for my granddaughter too. And so I was begging God for some straight paths. A few months after they, he had come back, my daughter comes to my house on a Thursday night. Don't ask me any questions, Mama. I'm packed to stay for a couple of weeks. Don't ask me what I'm going to do next. I just need to be here. Okay? And she came. About 24 hours after she came home, my son-in-law came after her as kind as you could ever imagine and polite and probably talked to me more that weekend than we'd ever talked in all the years we'd known each other prior to it. And off goes my daughter and my granddaughter back to be with him. My suspicions were mounting that there was not only what was already toxic, but that it was escalating into what would be called full-blown abuse in that relationship. And so I would, and they were young and very eager for me to do this, I would go every weekend and pick up my granddaughter and bring her to my house. Just thinking, if I can just have her on the weekends, then we can pour some stability and some goodness into her world while she's suffering through this season in her life. And so I would drive an hour and a half to where they lived, and I would pick her up and take her, take her home with me. And just barely two years old, I would drive back to deliver her back to their house. And just a few blocks from their house, Misty would recognize where we were. And she would begin to cry, Nana, Nana, no, Nana, no, no, please, Nana, no. And I would literally have to peel her off of me and put her in my daughter's arms and turn around and leave knowing that me, who had been her security and her stability, was having to leave her in that place that was neither secure nor stable. And I'll tell you this, that road back home did not seem like a straight path at all. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make your path straight. I cried out to God, and I begged Him to complete His word in my daughter's life. It was during those long rides home that I began to really understand what surrender truly is. Surrender is more than trusting God with those I love. Surrender is more than merely giving God control of situations that are breaking my heart. Surrender is yielding myself to God for Him to have His way completely in me. It's a complete abandon of heart and mind to choose to honor God no matter what may come. It's what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did when they were faced with a fiery furnace. And they turned around to King Nebuchadnezzar and they said, we don't know about all that you're doing, and we don't know about that fiery furnace. I'm sure it's plenty hot enough to burn us up. And we don't know if our God will save us, even though we do know that He can. But what we know is that we cannot bow down to any other than the one true God. And so if you must, you must. And we will do what we have to do. That's surrender. Surrender is what Jesus did in the Garden of Gethsemane when He said, Lord, if it be Thy will... Please let this cup pass from me. And you know the rest of both those stories? God danced in the flames with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they got out of that fire and didn't even smell like smoke. But then he allowed his own son to be nailed to the cross. No matter what God might do, surrender is yielding all of me to all of him. And I'm going to add this, all the time. I was standing in worship one Sunday morning at my church and, and I was being um, 
just worshiping. And I had my eyes closed and one hand raised. That's about as charismatic as I get, just one hand up there. And I was, I was singing and I was worshiping. And the Lord very clearly spoke to my spirit. And he said, what are you doing, Leanne? I was like, I'm worshiping you, Lord. And he said, no, you're not. And I said, and I knew exactly what he was talking about. He said, you cannot worship me and harbor um, hatred in your heart for any other. And I began to tell him, uh, I mean, I had a list. And I began to tell him all the reasons why I could not, not in any way love that particular man in my life. And the Lord wouldn't let me off the hook because he doesn't do that. And he said, Leanne, I love him. And he reminded me that at the foot of the cross, anything he did or was doing or would do was no different than anything I did, was doing, or would do, and that to God all sin is sin, and that He and I stood on level ground. And if I wanted to stand and worship a Savior that was willing to die for me on a cross for all of my sins, then He was the same Savior that was willing to die for this guy for all of his sins, even though his sins were affecting me in a negative way. And God said to me, you have to let it go. And I said to the Lord, you're asking me to do what is impossible, and you're the one who gave me this mother heart anyway. We do that, you know, we want to put it back on him. And then the Lord said a very freeing thing to me. He said, I'm not asking you to do what you cannot do. He said, I'm merely asking you to let me do what I'm already doing through you. You just give your heart to me and let me love him through you. I was met with relief because I knew how to do that. I've been doing that since the first time that I was born again. Surrender is letting go. It's messy. It requires, surrender requires conscious effort. And surrender is letting God be God in and through your own life. 